number 13. Thank you for being here. Thank you for praying for us. Just pray that God would have his way in this service, please. Um, I'm going to read one verse just for the sake of time because we're going to be going through most of the chapter in the message. And um, I think that by telling you that, that should get you in the spirit of prayer. Amen. In verse number one, Jesus, the Bible said, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which, in the, were, which, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. I've been meditating on this scripture all week, but it wasn't until this morning on the way to church that the Spirit of God directed my heart as what he wanted in this service. I'd ask you to pray for me, please. I try to share with you what my precious Lord has shared with me. Father, thank you for the privilege to stand here today, open this precious old book. Lord, it's still yeah. speaking to hearts. It's still, Lord, exactly what we need in every generation. God, our country... Lord, seemingly has laid the book by the curb. Lord, I pray that we'd return to the book. And I pray, Lord, that we'd rejoice in the good truths that we find in the Word of God. God, I pray you'd stir someone's heart today, Lord, and help them to realize, Lord, there is such a thing called the end. And Lord, at the end, it's going to matter, Lord, where they stand with thee. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Bless our church, our Father. Lord, this week in the Bible school, Lord, every teacher, every worker, God, it takes so much, so much effort to put this Bible school on. I pray, God, you'd bless our efforts. Lord, we're nothing without you. Lord, the main thing that'll go out this week is the word of God. I pray, Lord, and find a lodging place in these young hearts. God will give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to preach for a little while this morning on this subject, things that will matter in the end. Things that will matter in the end. Jesus said here, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. The word of God said here that he knew that his hour was come when he was going to depart out of this world. Can I remind you this morning that that hour is coming for every one of us? When we're going to depart out of this world. What's really going to matter then? Is it going to matter what kind of degree I had behind my name and that certificate on the wall? I doubt it. Is it going to matter whether my vehicle had 100,000 on it or 10 or 300,000 on it? I doubt it. Is it going to matter whether my home was brick or whether it was vinyl sided or whether it was a shack out in the country? I doubt it. I'll tell you what's going to matter. And that's these things that God has told us right here in the precious word of God. Our salary is not going to matter. Our insurance is not going to matter. The stock market's not going to matter. Republicans and Democrats are not going to matter. Say amen. amen. I'm telling you, beloved, what's going to matter is the truth. Jesus said this truth will stand. I'll give you five things that God put in my heart that are going to matter in the end. Number one, love will matter. In the end, Jesus said, having loved his own, he loved them yeah. to the end. Yeah. I pray that when my time comes to leave this world, I can have loved my Lord to the end. I pray that I could have loved my wife and my children and my grandchildren to the end. I pray that I could love my church, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ to the end. Amen. You may not understand this, but I pray that God will let me love sinners right up until the end. I pray if some sinner comes by my bedside and it's time to leave out of this world, that God will give me enough breath that I could whisper to them the truths of the word of God and a desire to meet them in heaven one day after a while. Amen. I tell you, that's going to matter in the end. Jesus, the word of God, said, having loved his own, 
He loved them until the end. I'm not going to go into all the text and read it all this morning. But one thing you see in the chapter is love commended. What that means is the Bible said over there in the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That word commendeth there means demonstrated. I'm telling you this morning, Jesus didn't just tell these old boys that he loved them. He demonstrated that he loved them. He got up from the supper and he got, took a towel and gird himself and got him a basin and, and some water and said, boys, I want to wash your feet. Amen. Jesus didn't come to minister, to be ministered unto, but to minister. And Jesus in all this said, I've given you an example. Amen. How that we ought to love one another and how that we ought to care one for another. Love is commended. Jesus demonstrated it. The greatest love was commended at Calvary. The word of God said, greater love hath no man than this, and a man would lay down his life. There's not one parent in this room that wouldn't lay down their life for their youngin. I was watching the news early, early this morning, and a little girl, I believe it was Mary in Virginia, I remember that now, a little girl went to turn her bicycle up on the curb, and the curb grabbed the wheel and threw her out in the traffic. That little girl, half of her scalp is off right now. Half of her skull is off trying to relieve the pressure on her brain. And they're asking people to pray. I want you to know something, beloved, that mother, that father would gladly take the place, amen, of that little girl this morning. Aren't you glad for a Savior that gladly took the place of you and I at Mount Calvary, amen? You and I deserve to die. You and I deserve to be spit on. But he took our place because he loves us. What a blessing that is. Love will matter in the end. I promise you that. I pray that my children can come by. Say, if I can't tell you everything about Daddy, but I can tell you one thing. He loved us. Amen. Amen. I tell you what, I can't tell you everything about Jesus. I don't know everything about Jesus, but I can tell you one thing about Jesus. He loved us. He loves us, and he will forever love us as his children. What a blessing. What a blessing. And then we see love commanded. It's not just commended. Jesus didn't just demonstrate love in this chapter. But if you'll look with me at verse 34 and verse 35, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Let me tell you this, beloved. Listen, really, 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 when it's all said and done, there's only one way that this world can tell that we love God. You can stand and say it until Jesus comes. But there's only one way that proves it out. That's just like faith over in the book of James. Faith without works is dead, being alone. But I'm telling you, beloved, the Bible said if we love one another, that's what God said, amen. He said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one toward another. I tell you, beloved, I believe this love that Jesus gives his children can help you love your enemy. Pray for them that despitefully use you, them that persecute you. Beloved, I believe that with all of my heart. Love will matter in the end. Secondly, this morning, the condition of the heart will matter in the end. Where is God going to find your heart? Look in verse number 2. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. This is amazing to me. You know, I, I left here last Sunday morning. Two hands that I saw went up. Another hand that I didn't see. Someone pointed that out to me that was in the rear of the church. I will tell you something, beloved. Listen to me. Just as sure as God puts it in a person's heart to trust Jesus, there's a slew foot, a devil, that puts it in a person's heart, something like this, uh, maybe later. Just as sure as God wants to do something good, the devil wants to hinder it every time. 
here the devil had put it in the heart the condition beloved of the heart you see look in verse number 10 Jesus said to him he that is washed he's talking to Peter needeth not save to wash his feet but is clean every whit and ye are clean but not all you see there's one his name was Judas Jesus knew that his heart was not clean Jesus, beloved, listen, I I looked at this again sitting on the pew while the choir was singing to make sure I hadn't missed something. I don't believe I've missed anything on this right here. Beloved, I believe Jesus washed Judas' feet just like he washed everybody else's feet because, listen, nobody knows who it is that's going to betray him. Had Jesus skipped Judas, everybody would have had a good idea who it was that was going to betray him. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. But there was one. His name was John, you remember? It laid over on Jesus' breast. I'll talk about this in a minute. You remember? He said, who is it, Lord? And Jesus said, the one whom I dip the sop and give it to. Beloved, I want you to know I believe with all of my heart that my Lord didn't treat treat Judas any different than he treated all the rest of them. I believe God, beloved, listen, this morning, wants us to understand that the condition of the heart will matter in the end. Externally, they all look the same. Externally, they were all in the same group, but it was the condition of the heart Oh, beloved friend, I can remember going to church years ago after being a church member for six and a half years. I can remember Bob Steele uh, preaching in that meeting. And I can remember asking God to speak to my heart. Oh, God, speak to my heart. Lord, I just don't know. I want to know for sure I'm saved. Speak to my heart. Help him to preach. He went in there. I went in that meeting. It was over in Blackwell's Chapel, Virginia. I can't remember the name of the church right now. I can about see the pastor's face. John was his first name. Brother Bob preached on the wheat and the tares. He said they look just alike. He said they spring up together. He said they grow up together. And he said there's not a man living can tell them apart till harvest time. He said harvest time is what separates the wheat from the tares. That wheat, beloved, will have a head on it. And I'm going to tell you something right now. This preacher, no preacher, can look out in a congregation like this and separate them. But I'm telling you, there's a God in heaven, beloved, that's looking at hearts this morning. He knows who's been washed in the blood. He knows who's playing the game and going through the motions. And he loves you anyway. He wants to save your never dying soul. It's not a game. The condition of the heart is going to matter in the end. What a blessing. I remember years ago hearing the song about one dark night in Egypt. You remember it, Brother Ralph, I bet. And, uh, but the little boy asked his father, said, would you go and see if the blood is still there? Well, Hallelujah. I'm glad I can report to you that on February 22nd, 1987, blood was supplied in my life. I'm glad I can report to you when it comes time to examine my heart in the harvest. Thank God Almighty, my Savior will let me in, not because of preaching or praying or anything else, but because of the blood that's been applied in my heart and in my life. Love is going to matter in the end. The condition of the heart is going to matter in the end. Number three, look at verse number three. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Let me tell you what's going to matter in the end. Listen to me carefully, beloved. Listen, there's an education system today that's trying to tear down what I'm about to tell you. What's going to matter is knowing where you come from and knowing where you're going. I'm glad I know where I come from. I'm glad an ape didn't have nothing to do with it. 
I'm glad my heavenly father, beloved, listen, gave me life. Then again, he gave me life eternal when he saved me. It was him, beloved, that gave us. In him was life. And the light was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness when our substance was not yet formed. And he was looking in my mama's little belly. He knew who I was. Do what I do. And he loved me. Everything that took place in my life was pointing me to Calvary, pointing me to a day when I could trust him. Beloved, it's not funny what's being taught today. Beloved, it's just not funny at all that some little blob washed up onto the shore. That little blob grew some legs. It climbed up in a tree and grew a tree, uh, grew a tail and swung by its tail in that tree. It's a mess. It takes more faith to believe a lie and be damned than it does to believe this precious old book right here. Thank God for the book. Thank God we know where we come from. Thank God we know where we're going. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And I thank God I know I come in naked and I'm going out naked. We're not taking anything with us, beloved. You'll never see a U-Haul behind the hearse. Amen. We're going to go meet Jesus one day soon. What a blessing. The Bible said we're fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible said in Genesis, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, make man in our image. What a blessing it is to know who made us and know where we're going. Amen. Know where we came from. And know where we're going. That's going to matter in the end. A couple more things and I'm done. Number four, being close to the Savior will matter in the end. I want to be close to him, don't you? Amen, Brother Ralph. I want to be close to him when he comes for me. I want to be close to him. I want to be close to my wife, close to my children, close to my church. I want to be close to my Savior. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Look here with me, if you will. Verse 21 <clears throat> and following. When Jesus had thus said, he said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of the disciples, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Somebody tell me who's writing this book. Who's writing it? Under the inspiration of? He's wanting to increase our faith. Ain't that the reason he said he, he wrote it? That we might believe, right? I want you to see something I think it's important. If you want to know something about the character of John, I believe there would at least be a tendency. I'll just say it like this with me. Maybe you don't have the problems I have. But I believe I might have been prone to write something like this, Brother Ralph, the disciple that loved Jesus. I'll be honest with you. I believe that would have been absolutely accurate. But there was one thing in John's mind that was more important than the fact that he loved Jesus. And that was that Jesus loved him. John is the one that gave us the little text over in the book of 1 John that said, we love him. But don't forget this. It's because he first loved us. Amen. We need to be close to the Savior because that's going to matter in the end. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, John, Brother Steve, he's real close. He's right up in the bosom of our Lord at this supper. I... If I understand it correctly, I believe he's listening to his heartbeat. He's that close. Boy, boy, to be able to hear the heartbeat of the Savior. 
I believe his heart still beats for sinners. Look at John. And then look at Peter. Peter down here, look at it with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither the goest thou? Verse 36, Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus said, answered unto him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice or three times. Let me ask you something. Where would you rather be in the end? Would you rather be out in the courtyard with Peter warming your hands with the devil's crowd? Denying that you ever knew him? Or would you rather be, have your head laid right over on the bosom of the Savior? Let me tell you something. I believe being close to Christ will matter in the end. Some of you all in this church, you sing like birds. It blesses my heart every time you open your mouth and let the words come out that exalt our Savior. You ought to be praying that God will give you a song even in the end. You ought to be praying that God will let you sing somebody a song Letting them know that you're close to the Savior, even in the end. I'll give you this, and I'm done. Love will matter in the end. The condition of the heart, it will matter in the end. Knowing where we came from as well as where we're going, it will matter in the end. Being close to the Savior will matter in the end. Let me stop right quick and say something. You say, preacher, how, how can I know if I'm close to him? I believe this with all my heart. We'll never be any closer to him than we are to this book. If this book means nothing to us, we don't have time for this book. We don't need to kid ourselves. The Bible said it's daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. I believe with all of my heart we need a revival of the reading, a revival of the memorizing. Oh, let me encourage young people, while you've got that brilliant mind, hide as much of this as you can in your heart and in your life. Be close to the book. Be close in prayer. The last thing I want to give you is what's going to matter in the end is the lessons that we've learned from our mistakes. It's going to matter in the end. You say, preacher, I don't know why you said that. Well, I'm, I'm relatively sure. I know I've said this before, and I'm relatively sure I've said it here. Surely there's somebody here that didn't hear it that day. If it were up to me, Brother Preston, and I was looking for me a preacher to preach on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people are going to give their heart and life to Jesus and believe the gospel message I was looking for me a preacher, I would have chosen John. John, the one that 
leaned upon his bosom, the one that went all the way to Calvary and had the blessing of hearing the Savior say to him, Son, behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. The word of God said that Mary went home with John from that day. How many believes he took good care of her? You say, preacher, why are you magnifying lessons that we learn from our mistakes? Let me tell you something about mistakes. Listen, everybody in this building needs to hear this. They don't have to be final. When Peter was out there warming his hands and Peter was out there cursing and Peter was out there denying, it's bad, but it's not final. I believe there's people in this room today the only reason you're in this room today is because there's a God. And I'll raise my hand that gives us another chance. Amen. And it's the lessons that we learn from the mistakes that we make in this life. That's what's going to matter in the end. I think that's why Jesus carefully worded what he said to, John, uh, to Peter when he said, whether I go Thou canst not follow me. What's the next words? Now. I believe, Brother Steve, Jesus in his heart and mind already knew about the shore when they would fish all night, catch nothing. He'd make them some fish, make them some bread, invite them to dinner. Then he'd look at Peter and say, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Feed my sheep. Glory to God. I'm glad God can take a life that's an absolute wreck and turn it around and use it for his glory. Young people especially, some of y'all going off to college, some graduating high school, some in college. Those mistakes don't have to be final. The devil will jump up on you. The devil will tell you there's nothing God can do. I want you to know the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, can cleanse us from all sin. And God can take that that in the eyes of man, in the eyes of this world, even in the eyes of God, it's a total failure. And pick it up. I like the song. I haven't heard it in years. Somebody sing it for me for long. He doesn't throw the clay away. How many's ever heard that song? Over and over, he molds me and makes me into his image he fashions the clay he's the potter you see you and I are the clay beloved in this text we need to learn from our mistakes because it's going to matter in the end failure does not have to be final we can get up, amen, and serve God. Jesus knew in this text in verse number one that his hour had come. What hour, preacher? The reason that he had come into the world was to die. He knew that the hour had come. He was about to die. Beloved, what would change in your life today? If you knew that your hour had come. If you knew, I was back there, I come by the children's church a while ago. Justin and Landon run and grab me around the legs. You know what I believe? I believe he knows I love him. One of the reasons he believes that is because mommy and daddy 
has confirmed that in his heart. I believe he knows his mom and daddy loves him. It ain't going to be long. The Holy Ghost will let him figure out how much Jesus loves him. That's going to be the main thing. Are we aware that our hour is coming? Listen to this and I'm done. How many ever heard of a preacher named D.L. Moody? Thursday, December 21st, 1899. Well, that's almost into the 1900s. I didn't realize how close that was. My birthday's December the 31st, in case you wanted to know it. 1959, I almost got into the 60s. Amen. Thursday, December 21st, 1899, after cutting short a Kansas City crusade and returning home in ill health, D.L. Moody told his family, he said, I'm not discouraged. He said, I want to live as long as I am useful. But when my work is done, I want to be up and off. The next day, Moody awakened after a restless night. In careful, measured words, he said, Earth recedes. Heaven opens before me. His son, Will, concluded his father was dreaming. No, son, this is no dream. It is beautiful. It is like a trance. He said, if this is death, then death is sweet. There's no valley here. God is calling me, and I must go. Sounds to me like a man. That was pretty close. Pretty close to his Savior. Pretty close to his Lord. How many's glad you come this morning? How many believes there's some things that's going to matter in the end? I thought about this as God helped me to meditate in this chapter this week. I don't know who this is original with, but I, I do know it's not original with me. I heard it and it stuck. I heard a preacher say, my greatest fear is not that I will fail, but that I will succeed at something that really doesn't matter. Think about that for a moment. Listen, everybody can't be a preacher. Everybody can't be an evangelist. Everybody can't be a missionary. Everybody doesn't have the gift to teach. Everybody doesn't have the gift to sing. You say, preacher, what are you saying? If I do this job, then, and, that I succeed at that? No, 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 no. Listen to him carefully, beloved. God needs everybody. What everybody needs to know is, and you can't know this for anybody except yourself, is that you're in the will of God doing what God wants you to do serving him when you know that that's a good way to leave out of here amen in the will of God doing what God wants you to do let's bow for prayer sister Becky if you'd get me a song just play softly for just a moment I appreciate it say preacher why you give an invitation because the Bible said the spirit and the bride say come let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come and drink of the water of life freely. Beloved, I believe there's somebody in this building today that needs a drink. Somebody that's tired of a life of sin. Somebody that would like to have a brand new start. Somebody that would like to have that guilt off of you. Somebody that would like to know if you never wake up again, heaven would be your home. There's somebody here today and say, Preacher, I've never met Jesus in faith. I've never trusted him to be my Savior. I've never been born again. My life has never changed.
Priest, pray for me. Is there somebody like that here today? Pray for me. Please remember me.